All right, so what's the deal with these Piper rudders? What's this airworthiness directive all about? And how does it affect me and my J3 Cub? Let's get into it. All right, so in a previous video where I was talking about my overall restoration plans, which I'll uh, link here above, I talked a little bit about the airworthiness directive on the rudder, and I mentioned a couple of things, but I got some good comments in the video asking some questions about it. And in watching the video, I also realized that I didn't fully explain what my options were. And so I thought it'd be really good to do just a full video talking about this airworthiness directive, talking about what needs to happen and what I can potentially be doing here with this airplane. All right, so first of all, what's going on? So this all stems from a couple of aircraft accidents that happened in Alaska with high wing pipers. All right, so before we go any further, I do have to get into what is the legal definition of an aircraft accident. Now, I know when most people think aircraft accident, you think crash, right? However, there is a strict legal definition. So when it comes to the FAA and the NTSB, an aircraft accident, there's a few things that classify it as such. For one, it has to happen between engine start with the intent to go fly and when all the passengers and crew get off the airplane at the end of the flight. The second thing is it has to involve either serious injury, loss of life, those make sense, or substantial aircraft damage. Now, what's substantial aircraft damage? Again, there's a legal definition and it involves essentially any failure of the structure of the aircraft, as well as anything that impacts its handling qualities. So for the case of these two Pipers in Alaska, even though no one was hurt, no one was killed, and the airplanes landed safely, because the rudder was damaged in a way that can impact the handling qualities of the aircraft, and because it happened obviously in flight for both of these, they are officially classified as aircraft accidents. And that is how they are referred to within the Airworthiness Directive. One of these accidents was on a PA-12, the other one was on a PA-14. A couple of things about these accidents, they both involved Alaskan airplanes, you know, standard, hardworking, heavily modified. These were both high horsepower aircraft, and crucially, they had both been modified with beacons on the top of the rudders. Now, what happened on both of these accidents is the rudder post, which is running right, right along here on the front of the rudder, failed just above the top hinge where the rudder attaches. And then this whole top part of the rudder here that sticks out, folded over and caught on the horizontal stabilizer brace wire right here. In both cases, the airplanes were able to land safely and they had enough rudder authority to obviously to come in and land safely. But as the FAA has noted in the airworthiness directive, they quite probably did not have enough rudder authority for the full design envelope that the airplane is, is rated for. Very fortunate that no one was hurt or killed, but definitely you can see a major potential issue for safety. If you can imagine how much of the rudder is over, clearly you're not getting the, the aerodynamic effects that are expected with the design. And then of course, with part of the rudder hanging up here on the horizontal stabilizer bracing wire, you can see how that could be a major issue. So that's what happened with both of those airplanes. So after that, the FAA obviously took a very hard look at what was going on. One of the things they determined for both accidents was that it was a combination of corrosion and fatigue failure. This is very important. We'll get into why that is in a little bit. So the FAA came out with a draft airworthiness directive and they drafted up an AD that applied to essentially all high wing Piper aircraft that have this style rudder, which is all of them manufactured out of 1025 low carbon steel, which is all Piper aircraft produced prior to, I believe the 1970s. I'll put the date in the subtitles. Just can't remember it off the top of my head. So the FAA came out with this draft airworthiness directive that said essentially, okay, all these high wing Pipers with these rudders built out of 1025 low carbon steel, the rudder has to be replaced essentially. Obviously that applies to a ton of airplanes because Piper kept this design basically the same across all the high wing Pipers. So obviously this applies to a ton of aircraft. So a lot of different advocacy groups got involved pushing back on this AD saying, hey, maybe we can tailor it back somehow, that sort of thing. At the end of the day, the FAA 
took all of that and all those comments that were made are incorporated into the AD in terms of they explain what the comments were and explain why the FAA accepted or rejected them, mostly rejected them, um, to be completely honest, and then issued the final AD. The one place the final AD does kind of make some concessions is it breaks down the timeline for compliance into four different categories. Category one, which both of the accident airplanes would have fallen into, is a beacon on the top of the rudder and over 150 horsepower. In that category, you have to have complied with the airworthiness directive within two years. Category two is either a beacon or over 150 horsepower, in which case you have three years to comply. Category three is no beacon and between 100 and 150 horsepower, in which case you have five years. And then category four is no beacon and under 100 horsepower, in which case you have 10 years to comply. So the Coastal Patrol Cub, I do have an upgraded motor from stock, but I'm still only at 85 horsepower. As you can see, I do not have a beacon on my rudder. So I have 10 years to comply with the airworthiness directive. Right, I've got plenty of time. And I mentioned that in my previous video. I don't have to do the rudder right now. I don't have to deal with it. I have 10 years from the issuance of the airworthiness directive to comply. But what does comply mean? There's a couple of things that I did mention in the video and one major thing that I did not mention in the video. I mentioned earlier, both of the accident airplanes had 1025 low carbon steel. The approved solution of the airworthiness directive is to replace the rudder with a more modern construction, which uses 4130 chromoly. The thing is, my airplane was restored in 1984. It had a lot of work done on it. It is entirely possible that my rudder is no longer stock and has already been replaced with an aftermarket rudder, which is more than likely, if that is the case, made out of 4130 chromoly. So, step one, and this is what I did not mention in my previous video, is to actually get this rudder tested. So we can peel the fabric back. There's an acid test that you can do on the metal itself that'll tell you what type of metal you have. What's interesting to me that I actually didn't know until I started researching for this video is that 1025 is actually more corrosion resistant than 4130. However, 4130 is a stronger and more durable material. Now, remember what I said earlier was the failure of these rudders was found to be corrosion and fatigue. And that's important because if it was only corrosion that was the issue, then 1025 would actually be better. But it is a corrosion fatigue issue. And that's why the rudder beacon matters here is because it applies greater loads to the top of the rudder. So the 4130 plays a factor here because it's a tougher material. So basically the way the FAA has come down on this and why they're applying it to all airplanes is they're saying, hey, no matter what, whether you have a beacon or not, no matter what horsepower you have, we are concerned that the fatigue on these rudders is eventually going to start causing them to fail. We are fortunate that nobody has crashed or died yet, but we are not confident that will continue to be the case. We really need this addressed for all aircraft. There is obviously a lot of debate whether this is the right move or the wrong move, but I will at least say I can see where the FAA is coming from on this one. I can definitely see it. I understand the argument to be made of like, hey, we've only had these couple of failures and they're very special cases, but I can definitely see the FAA's point of, hey, maybe this just highlighted an issue that as these planes get older, fatigue cycles on these rudders are going to keep increasing. We might start to see more issues and the next person might not be so lucky. So I do see that. As I've said before, if you like what I'm doing here, if you could be so kind as to give the video a like, maybe give me a subscribe and certainly share this with your friends. All those things do a world of wonders for the YouTube algorithm, get me on in front of more people. And uh, certainly if you have any questions on the video or anything you want to say, if you could leave a comment below, that's also super helpful for me. But uh, I really appreciate you being here. I appreciate you watching this and I hope you're getting something out of it. Okay, so we say I get my rudder opened up and tested and it's 4130. Cool, that is the airworthiness directive complied with. I can prove that my rudder is already 4130, I meet the airworthiness directive, and I am good to go. So I might not have to replace my rudder at all, right? So that would be the best case scenario. 
My luck is not usually that good, so I'm planning on that not being the case. And so that's why I talked in the video the way that I did, is I am just planning on having to do a more robust compliance step here. But I should at least mention that I don't necessarily have to replace my rudder since I know work has been done on the airplane previously. And since it is entirely possible that that rudder has been replaced, first step, I'm definitely going to get it tested. So now, what's the next step? Obviously, the simple answer is replace the rudder. That is the most straightforward, obvious way to comply with the airworthiness directive as written. However, there is another process, and it's actually mentioned within the airworthiness directive. One of the comments on the original draft that was pushed forward was saying, hey, are, are there repairs that can be done to the rudders that you can account for within the airworthiness directive? The FAA came back and said, we are not going to address repairs within the airworthiness directive itself because of all the possible variations that are out there. It would be outside the scope. However, there exists a process to do that called an alternative method of compliance, AMOC, A-M-O-C. And that AMOC process should suffice in this case. And sure enough, as soon as the airworthiness directive was dropped, people started going out and saying, okay, is there a way I can modify my rudder that the FAA will accept to say, okay, that meets the intent of what we're trying to do here. And you can go forth and you are in compliance with the airworthiness directive through this alternate method of compliance. So the one that I have personally seen already approved essentially involves cutting open, reaming out that rudder post and putting in an insert of 4130. So you still have your overall rudder structure is the same. So now you have a 4130 reinforcement inside that rudder post that is going to give you that fatigue resistance that 4130 gives you without having to replace the entire rudder. So that is certainly an option. So yeah, so that's where I'm at is first things first, I got to get this rudder tested, figure out if I need to do anything at all. If I do, then now I have to make the decision. Do I go ahead and replace the entire rudder or do I try and get it sleeved and do the alternate method of compliance and just get it repaired in such a way that I can keep using the rudder that I have? There's pros and cons to both. Happy to hear in the comments if there's anything else about this airworthiness directive that you have a question about that you'd like me to comment on. Uh, for sure, drop it in the comments and I can address it uh, either directly or in a future video.